Hey there, amazing audience who have joined the revolving time today. Get ready to embark on an unforgettable adventure with us. Subscribe now and let's uncover the hidden secrets and truths together. Today, we're diving into a topic that's tough, but one that each and every one of us might encounter on our journey, dealing with deceit and betrayal. Well my friends, today's story is published by QHML1. My wife cheated on me with her co-stars. On investigation I found irrefutable evidence of her deception. After the divorce I stepped into my new life. Well let's start the part 2 and see how I got a happy life after so many ups and downs. If you haven't seen part 1 of this story, see the top comment or description, there's a link. The major met me at the door and he wasn't smiling. Jason had his headphones on and when he looked up and saw me, he handed me a pair. The first thing I heard was Jimmy. No fun and games tonight boys. Roy is a little ticked about the time I'm spending here. I can only justify so much. A male voice, later identified as Jack, started whining. Damn it. I was looking for a little fun tonight. I still remembered Philip's voice as he spoke. Calm down Jack. We can wait. We're almost in. When we get there, we all disappear to the Caymans for a very enjoyable life. Jimmy giggled. At least you two can console each other. I intend to rock Roy's world tonight. In fact, I'm going to ramp it up a bit. Keep him calm and relaxed. Besides, he's a pretty good lover and I need to get all that I can. Jack wanted to whine but she cut him off. Get over yourself Jack. Go home and duck Philip. Philip laughed. Come on, honey, give Jimmy a kiss and when we get home, I'll duck you. Jimmy giggled. You lucky boy. You'll be walking funny tomorrow. Jason switched off the headphones. How? I cloned her phone and have total access. Every time she speaks, live or on the phone, it's recorded. He grimaced. She talks a lot. I had to put a filter on it so it only activates after keywords. Then she revealed some of their plants and I had to remove it. Now we have to listen to every word. My ears hurt. I'll let the major take over. I knew the man wouldn't sugarcoat it and I was right. She's ducking both those as holes, at least one more guy and two women. We have names and bios on all of them but the last male lover and we'll have that by tomorrow. I was rocked. How? Why? I thought she loved me. She did. I think she still does just a little. From what I heard she doesn't want to ruin you, but she does want all your ready cash, including the prenup trust fund you established. Well then, there was 300 grand in it now, plus about 40,000 in our checking account. My investment capital was a little over 600,000, so if she got it all it came up just shy of a million. A million was a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things but not something that would last her a lifetime. I said as much to the major, it seems you've rubbed off on her. She wants to invest the money in a donut franchise. She intercepted a call from the owner wanting you to invest and checked him out. She even went to see him in her capacity as an ad executive and your wife. She and her lover seem to think the place could be a gold mine. She's throwing our life away for donuts. Really? Why? Jason rejoined the conversation. Her lovers seem to have convinced her that you're having affairs. With who? With Celeste Richards, Jody Hathaway, and Amy Rogers. They even say you all have sacks together. I sighed. Damn, I'm a busy little beaver. I've never slept with Celeste and I haven't talked to her except on the phone in five weeks. Jody is a lesbian who has no use for a man, and Amy's a transvestite and the accountant for the club I invested in. And before you ask, I don't swing that way. What do I do now? The major smiled, a smile that probably struck terror into anyone he was interrogating. Now we get irrefutable truth. The conversations we've obtained are illegal and can never be used. What we can use them for is to track their movements and be there when they get together. Then we get pictures and audio when your prenup is upheld. I don't think it'll take us long. You need to go on a trip for a couple of days real soon. We also need to wire your house with audio and video recorders. I don't think they're dumb enough to do it in your house, but you never know. Tomorrow is Thursday. You can do it while she's at work. I'll tell her tonight that I have to be out of town Friday and may not get back until Sunday. She's already got the motive. This will just give her the opportunity. Update, I went home. What else was I gonna do? Luckily, I was there long enough to take a sleep aid I used occasionally when I traveled and was almost out of it when she got home. Jimmy slid into bed and rubbed up against me but gave up pretty quickly when I didn't respond. I laid there wondering how many more nights we would sleep together as husband and wife. I told her that I'd be leaving about noon to travel to Cleveland. What the HLL is in Cleveland a security service that's going out of business due to poor management. The major is going with me to evaluate the personnel. We should get through the interviews by tomorrow, but it may take until Sunday. There was a little resentment in her voice. And you're just now telling me. I shrugged. I didn't know about it until last night. It came up in the meeting we had. It could be quite lucrative, and it's just two days. I tell you what, 
Let's make a plan to go on vacation week after next. Somewhere warm, sandy, and private. I've heard the Caymans are nice this time of year, and we've never been there. I've had the feeling we're slipping away from each other lately, and I want to make sure you know how much I love you. She flinched at the Caymans' reference, but recovered quickly. Jimmy either had developed far more as an actress than I knew or she was genuinely moved. There were tears in her eyes when she kissed me. I'd love that, honey. Let's go to that place in Belize, instead. Maybe we can get the same bungalow and just forget about the world for a few days. Looking her in her eyes knowing it was never going to happen and lying about it was one of the hardest things I'd ever had to do. After she left, I packed for Cleveland. The major, Jim, met me at the airport. He'd already planned on going pending my agreement, so I really was going to Cleveland. We arrived and got the business part done pretty early, putting three men and a woman on contract for a year. They didn't even have to move if they liked Cleveland. We could just email them details and they could show up at the appointed time and place. When we got to the hotel Jim grinned. Put your phone in the hotel room. You're not staying, but your phone will make it look like it if anyone checks. One of the new operatives is going to come by and get it about 7 and take it with him while he dines at a very nice restaurant courtesy of us. Then he's going to walk around aimlessly downtown for an hour before returning it to your room. If she calls it will automatically forward to your new phone and she'll never know. I shuddered, glad he was on my side. We ended up at a very nice resort in the country. When we went down to dine, I was beyond surprised to find Celeste, Jody, Bob and Jan from the ad agency, Rick from the production company, and Chef Jean. Pretty much everyone I was in business with was at the table. I looked at the major. We're all tied to you through business, but more importantly friendship. This is a show of solidarity, Roy. You invest in more than businesses, son. Your strong suit is your ability to invest in people. We're all with you whatever you decide to do. I was overcome. Up until the time I went into business I was a pretty private person without a lot of friends. I could look around this table and know that even if we were tied to each other through business, they were there as my friends. Celeste had locked down on one hand and Jody had the other. After a few minutes Jody cleared her throat. What do you need us to do? Well, I'd sure appreciate some empty shoulders to cry on later. As for the rest, Jim has it covered. They all looked at him. They're planning a big after-play party tomorrow, according to the chatter we're hearing. They don't know it, but there's going to be a slightly larger number in the audience than normal. We'll mingle with the patrons at the post-production mingle. Anything they say there can be used because it's a public place, and there's no right to privacy there. We already know where they're going and have that covered. We can't legally put anything in the suite they will be using. But there are lots of listening devices out there that can record through walls. Plus, if say a curtain malfunctions and doesn't close all the way and one happens to be in a position to see through it, then it's perfectly legal to look and film through the window. The whole group will be filmed continuously from the start of the play until the end of their evening. There is no doubt there will be enough for Roy to divorce for cause and uphold the prenup. He sighed. There's going to be collateral damage. The other man and both women are married and not to any of the players. Tell us, Roy, how bad do you want it to be? Do you want her to go away quietly, or do you want to burn her and her friends down? Either way works for me. Oh, and I booked an appointment with who I consider the best divorce lawyer in the state, Monday morning at 10. She emailed me a list of things you'll need to bring, most importantly the copy of the prenuptial. I had to think about it. Most of my friends didn't know because they'd never had cause to see it. But when I'm wrong, I can turn into a vicious and vindictive bast. One of my first investments folded because my partner fooled around with the money and bankrupted the business on purpose. I recovered and followed him for a while. Every time he was about to get something good going, something would happen that would put him farther behind. I did it for four years before I figured I had my pound of flesh. I was still thinking when Jody piped up. Don't waffle, Roy. Be as decisive as you always have been. Put an end to it and get on with your life. Jim added his input. That's right. You don't have to be coy, Roy. Just get yourself free. His statement broke the tension and everyone grinned. The drinking began. I went to bed as they were singing 50 ways to leave your lover at the top of their lungs. Some even got the words right. I was a bit hungover when the phone rang the next morning. It seems my new ringtone was 50 ways to leave your lover. I suspected Jason. Still, it made me grin. Hello. Jimmy seemed happy. Good morning, honey. How's Cleveland? It's actually a lot better than I thought. It's clean, lots of parks and greenways, and the people are friendly. Still, it's Cleveland. I'll be glad to get home. I'll be glad when you're home too, honey. Well the good news is I got an early flight in the morning. I can probably be home by 8. That put a little kink in her plans. She was going to have to cut her fun short and able to be home when I arrived. I hoped she showered first. She faltered a bit but recovered. 
That's great. Remember my play is tonight. I might be a little grumpy in the morning. The play started at 8 and would be over before 10. Even if you factored in the mingle, she could be home by 11.30 easily. I couldn't resist a little jab. Well, don't get carried away. I know how pumped you are after a performance. I promise to be a good girl. I should be in bed by midnight. Yes, but with who? That's what went through my head as I disconnected. Jim came in grinning. Got her. She wasn't alone last night. While she was talking to you, she was in bed with a woman and the missing man from the group. Your bed. He's one of the board members. A married board member. The woman is married to a da in another county. Depending how you want to play, this it could get very sticky very fast. Well, there it was. I didn't have to wait. I decided on the spot to pull the trigger right after the play, during the mingle. How much would it cost to get that lawyer to draw up divorce papers for adultery and get alienation of affections actions for all the players? I know they won't be legal, but they will declare intent. He looked startled. Once you make a decision you don't duck around. Pun intended. It'll cost you some coins, but I can get it done. Move on it while I tell the group my plans. I called Celeste and Jody and met them for breakfast. Jody seemed a little shocked, but Celeste just smiled. Poor Jimmy. All this time and she still doesn't know who she was married to. This will destroy all of them and probably the guild. I doubt they can come back from a second scandal. After the chips fall, I'll help them get started up again, but I'll make damn sure they know it's the last time. Most of us flew home together and by the time we landed they had their own plan. All were going to be there for moral support. Jim was bringing in a few of the new bodyguards to keep just to keep it as civil as possible. I hung out at the agency, listening to the phone chatter. Jimmy seemed to be having last minute doubts. I think I'll skip tonight. Roy's coming home early and I can't afford to raise his suspicions. We're too close to the end to screw up now. That led to a flurry of calls between the conspirators. Most wanted her to come. The Daw's wife urged her not to. You're showing good sense girl. No need to screw up our playtimes. We'll have plenty of times later. Then she giggled. Besides, it'll be more for me and Janice. Break a leg tonight. None of the group were aware of her plans except Philip and Jack. Still going to burn them all. You play, you pay. Jason stopped by, grinning. Found you, hacker. It seems your pal Philip has a degree in computer science and works for an IT company. When it comes out what he did he'll probably be unemployed. Wanna have some fun? Jason spent an hour cross-hacking all of Philip's accounts. He even put the conversation about he and Jack being lovers, carefully editing out any reference to Jimmy on his Facebook page, declaring his love for Jack could not be denied and that they would be soulmates forever. It also seems he wasn't as good as he thought because Jason followed his electronic trail and recovered every dime they had taken so far. He's gonna SHT when this hits. I'd love to see his face. I just smiled. Come to the play. You can watch his face when I tell him I got all my money back. Update 1. Showtime. In more ways than one, I thought as I sat in the van that night. We were waiting until the very last minute to enter, waiting for the lights to go down and the curtain was up. I was a little surprised at my date for the night. It was Anne, the ex-wife of Philip. I didn't recognize her and she had to remind me who she was. She was 50 pounds lighter, and her hair was now blonde and flowed halfway down her back. It seems while she was married to the asshole she was at the end of her career as an MMA fighter. Her fighting name was Catherine the Great because of her size. She fought in heavyweight class and though she was never champion, she made a good bit of money before she retired. Unfortunately, Philip siphoned a lot of it off before she discovered it. It was right after the confrontation and she decided if he could cheat in marriage maybe it would be a good idea to see if he was up to anything else. She caught him just in time to preserve a little over half of her assets. It was the main reason she didn't have to pay him alimony. Seems he'd taken his half of the assets early. Anne was a stunningly attractive woman, far more attractive than I remembered. Then again, about all I saw of her was he body as she slammed into me. I still remembered what her fist felt like. As we talked. I found out she held three black belts in different styles and was proficient in two more. She held a degree in criminal justice and had worked as a cop until she got tired of the politics and harassment. Until now, she had freelanced as a bodyguard and was happy to work for Jim, telling me she wouldn't mind a permanent position. It occurred to me as we talked that all my investments and the friends I had made over the years were unintentionally geared towards this situation. Not something I had in mind as I said I do. I remembered Jody's crack about my luck and grinned. Maybe she had something there. Five minutes after the curtain opened, I handed Anne out of the van, getting a glimpse of her four-inch heels. How can you fight wearing those? She grinned. I don't wear anything with a strap. These are slip-on and I can be out of them in a second. Sometimes, if I'm not in a hurry, I leave them on. You'd be amazed how a four-inch heel buried in your crotch will take the fight out of someone. 
Well then, good to know. Her heels meant she towered over me by a good three inches, but I didn't care. I doubted seriously anyone would notice me beside her, and she laughed. I'm usually dressed in business attire. It feels good to glam up now and then. You seem to think so, anyway. I told her I heartily approved of her outfit, basically eye to eye with her cleavage. Her little black dress was what she called a high-low, high on the thigh and low on the cleavage. It got my vote. It got the vote of everyone else who noticed us slip into our balcony seats. I looked around as the play carried on. It had been a decision of my friends to go all out. Every guy in a tux, every woman dulled to the nines, as they put it. Jim was with his wife and at 45, she still had a killer body and her silver hair seemed to glow. Jason was with his new bride. She had on a very nice dress. The purple dress matched her hair perfectly. Celeste and Jody escorted each other. If Jody had her way it would have been a full date. I think this was the first time I'd ever seen her in a dress. Jimmy's bosses at the agency didn't attend at my request. They were pretty surprised when I asked them not to fire her. She didn't steal from you. I'm pretty sure she does a good job, so I'd like it if you would keep her on at least until the divorce is over. It would be hard for her to ask for support when she has a good paying job. They admitted she did a good job. One wanted to fire her on general principles, but the other, cooler-headed, partner talked her out of it. It all depended on how much publicity and fallout occurred. The play was pretty good, a scaled-down version of My Fair Lady. I watched Jimmy on stage and she seemed to glow. It hurt me to see how happy she looked. I wondered what her expression would be like in about 90 minutes. Jack and Philip were the male leads and they ate up the applause. The curtain calls lasted 15 minutes. They disappeared backstage before going out to the lobby to receive the adulation of their fans. I had two off-duty cops present to make sure nothing got out of hand and three of the bodyguards were acting as process servers. Each carried a dozen red roses. Jimmy was thanking a fan when she saw me and she really seemed happy to see me. When I didn't approach, she frowned and tried to work her way to me. One of the process servers stopped her, saying the roses were from an admirer. Your name is Jimmy McCoy, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well then, this is also for you. She handed her a big manila envelope and snapped a picture of Jimmy holding it. You've been served. Good night. She stood for a minute trying to process what was happening, glancing over at me before opening the package. There were several pictures of the action from the night before. Jimmy didn't say a thing. She looked at me for a second, then her eyes rolled up and she fainted. When she did some of the photos scattered and the friends trying to give her aid got an eye full. Jack looked like he wanted faint when he got his photo of him with the married Janice. The Daw's wife, to this day I can't remember her name, just rocked back and forth going no, no, no over and over. Janice screamed and ran from the building. Philip's reaction was the most interesting. Besides the papers for the lawsuit there was a note telling him the da, the one with the wife he was banked was due a package detailing all his illegal activities. He dropped the envelope and looked around wildly before settling on me. I'm gonna duck and kick you. He charged full speed, only to be met by Anne's heel to his dot that looked every bit as painful as she said. He was on the ground whimpering. It was a little overboard but our lawyer made a case it was just the adrenaline of the moment and she thought he made a threatening move towards her client. The cops came. The EMTs showed up. It was deja vu all over again. The exception being this was the last time. Upon the advice of my lawyer I made myself unavailable for a few days, long enough for the real papers to be served. I never returned to the house, I'd bought it for Jimmy and I didn't want it anymore. In the end I gave her 50 grand, the exact amount I'd added to the infidelity fund while we were married. I also gave her the house, but she also got the last 10 years of payments. I did give her the car because I'd bought it for her birthday the year before. All told, she netted about 175000 in assets. A good number, but it compared poorly with what she had lost. I found it hard to understand why she tried to rob the bank when she already had the combination to the safe. All she had to do was remain faithful. Of course, she tried to spin it. I wasn't buying anything she had to sell. In one of our few conversations I asked why she had swallowed every lie, why she never once checked to see if any of it was true. She had the money to hire a private investigator, or, God forbid, talk to me. She had no definitive answer. A week before the divorce she gave up and signed the papers. They did keep her on at the agency, but the warm working relationship was gone and it was pretty evident she would never rise higher than she was at the time it all went down. It was no surprise when she resigned and took a position out of town. All right, this is where I talk about all about the sacks with multiple partners who were all just aching to console me. It was a year or more before I even looked at other women. It took me that long to get my head back together. Update 2. All my friends and business associates stayed close, especially Celeste and Jody. 
After six months they decided I was going to be alright and left me to my own devices. I still woke up reaching across the bed for Jimmy. It takes a long time for years of love to fade away. The whole episode made me a little nervous, so I eased off on investing for a while, consolidating cash inflow. It would put me in a better position should something lucrative came along. I did make one more investment before I scaled back. The guy that had reached out about the donut franchise called to see if any progress was being made. He seemed destroyed when I gave him an abridged version of what had happened. His response was to express ship eight different flavors of his donuts, three dozen of each, to my office. They were piled in front of the door when I arrived. I got as many people as I could together for a taste test, and they all agreed. They were the best they'd ever tasted. Even Jody, health Nazi that she was, tried to sneak a dozen out as she left. My favorite was a molasses donut. It had to have instant artery hardening capabilities and contain at least 2 million calories, but I couldn't stop eating them. The guy was from Louisiana, so I flew down to look over his operation. He had one shop in a small town and it took me 40 minutes to get in the door because of the customers. I got a donut and a surprisingly good cup of coffee, another Louisianan product heavily blended with chicory. When things eased up I introduced myself. The counter manager turned out to be his daughter and she yelled into the back. Pops, the money man is here. The guy bustled from the back, soaked in sweat with a collapsed paper hat on his head. He was about 5'3 in any direction you wanted to measure. A Cajun from a small parish no one had ever heard of. His speech was hard to follow but he beamed with enthusiasm and was impossible not to like. I tried to talk business, but he stopped me. I make the donuts. My daughter handles the business end. She thinks we could go statewide, maybe four or five more shops. You should talk to her. If she says okay we do business, gotta go back to work. I set up an appointment for 6 o'clock that night, snagged another molasses donut and left. The appointment turned out to be at her home. She fed me an authentic Cajun dinner, most of the dishes really good if exceptionally spicy. Her husband was there, home from a job on an oil rig. She had three children from the age of 3 to 13, all girls. After the dishes were cleared and we all had cups of the coffee that I was getting addicted to, we hashed things out. The first thing I wanted to know was how he came up with the recipe and what made them taste so much better. Pops makes his own flavorings, from vanilla on up. He makes most of it in 50-gallon food-grade drums and they have to sit at least a year. If we go into business together, we'll have to find somewhere to produce in volume. That could be a problem with the startup. We have enough to run three stores for a year, besides ours, right now. How many did you have in mind? She nearly fainted when I told her. Three will do for a test market, but you have no idea how original your donuts taste. My vision is to have one in every city in the state with a population of over 20,000. I thought we'd branch out to Texas, Alabama, Georgia, until we cover the South. I figure in 10 years we can be nationwide, maybe even international in select markets. How does that sound? It sounds like too much. I don't know if my dad will go for that. We can talk to him and see. It took about a month to convince him to go with my proposal. Since I was shouldering the burden financially, I got the lion's share of the profits. He finally agreed when I told him I'd put a buyout clause in the contract. 5% a year until he owned it totally. The startup deal was 70-30 and I exempted his original shop. He retained sole ownership of that one. Then it was a struggle to get him to focus on making enough flavorings to support the stores. I had to bring in experts to explain how it worked and that we had to legally protect the recipes to thwart imitators. I put a clause in the contract that stated at some time in the future we consider bottling and selling the flavors as a secondary business. Eight months after we signed the contract, we opened a shop in New Orleans. When the locals discovered how good they were they tried to keep it a secret, but the ad agency killed that. Soon they were so swamped we had to add a second location just to make donuts. Then we opened in Shreveport and Baton Rouge. Word had gotten out, especially when a Food Network star did a show on them. Celeste did a disclaimer at the start of the show, saying she was a personal friend and though I owned the majority of the stock I had little to do with the making of the donuts. Gaston was a big fan and could not believe she was doing a show on his little enterprise. We had the flavor factory running three shifts and they barely kept up. Gaston insisted that they age at least six months and if they didn't pass his personal test they had to remain in barrels. After we got established, I hired a well-respected CEO and made Gaston's daughter his second in command. He had come out of retirement to train her and just as soon as he felt comfortable with her progress, he'd go back into retirement with a significantly larger retirement fund. Then I kind of just vegged out. Oh, I kept up my exercise regimen or Jody would have killed me. I took a lot of trips to remote places, sleeping under the stars and enjoying nature. 
One trip impressed me so much I had an agent looking for some land in the area, thinking I may eventually build a vacation home that could become a retirement one later on. I still checked on everything I invested in, took meetings, but everything was running smoothly so I didn't worry. I was checking on the bar. The terrible three, Amy, Desiree, and Tina wanted a meeting. Amy laid it out for me. This place is a gold mine for you. We think it's time for you to branch out. Other towns could benefit from what we've achieved here. Our community is crying out for places like this, places where we can feel safe. We've done a little research and found a good spot. The location is great. It's in a low crime progressive area, so we think we'll be accepted with a minimum of protests. Would you consider it? We did. Jody decided she didn't want to participate except as a limited investor. I wasn't really interested either so I laid it out for them. I'll invest 30%. Jody is good for another 20. The rest you have to raise on your own. We can't raise that kind of money. No, but you can borrow it. We don't have credit for that. I grinned. Yes, you do. I'll loan it to you. I'll keep the payments low, and the interest rate will be prime plus 1%. You can call on me if you need help, but this will be your business. When the crying and hugging stopped, I pulled the papers out of my case and gave them to Amy. Look them over, then get a lawyer to do a follow-up. Sign them and you're in business. The buyout clause was in. 5% a year until they owned it all. Update 3. I was getting ready to leave and it was just Tina and I in the office. Roy, can I ask a favor? Depends. How big is the strap on? Tina giggled. Don't say that too loud. My boyfriend can be one jealous BTCH and he loves my strap on. 10 inches. Too much information. What's the favor? We we'll have a prom next month. It's for all our people who for obvious reasons never got to attend one in high school. It's turned into a big deal. We had to rent the local college's gym and we've reached capacity. Well, almost. There is one set of tickets left. And, and we want you to take Amy. She's crushed on you since the first time she saw you. Her boyfriend just dumped her for a real girl. He said some pretty hurtful things to her as he left. She was really looking forward to the prom, and now she won't go. Tina, I, stop right there. We know you're not attracted to girls like us. If you ever were, we'd smother you. But you like Amy as a friend, and lots of friends go to events together. Give her a nice memory. I thought about it that night before I turned in. The next morning, I surprised Amy by showing up at her business. She'd gone out on her own and since she was sole owner, she dressed full time. Most of her customers never knew. She rose from her desk. Roy, is something wrong at the club? I took her hand. Nothing wrong. Miss Amy, would you consider allowing me to be your escort to the prom? I happen to think I look pretty good in a tux and I'm sure you'll be beautiful. Well, she went pale and I thought she might faint but she recovered nicely. She had her door open and all six of her employees could hear us. My, this is so sudden. Let me think. Yes, she threw her arms around my neck and I felt the tears on her cheek. I let her hold me for a long time before she turned me loose. I expect fine dining and a really nice corsage. Noted. Until then, I think her whole group charged into her office as I left. I had a feeling it was going to be an unproductive day. I showed up in a limo at the appointed time, corsage in hand. She was absolutely beautiful. I got a glimpse of black garters when I handed her into the limo. We turned heads at the most expensive restaurant in town when we entered. The guys stared in undisguised lust and the women stared in admiration. After an excellent but light meal, we arrived at the venue. The decorations were perfect, the refreshments top drawer. We had a table with Desiree and her new husband, Tina and her boyfriend, and in a surprise, with Celeste and Aaron, one of the first people we'd met at the first time we visited the bar. We had our pictures taken. First as couples, second as a group, and finally with each other individually. The highlight was Amy and I getting voted king and queen of the prom. We shared the spotlight dance and she cried the whole song. When it was over, she pulled back and looked me in the eye. I love you. She saw the concern on my face. Not like that. Well, maybe like that. If you like girls like me, I'd have your ring on my finger before you knew what was going on. No, I love you for being the friend I needed when I needed one most. The friend who believes in me enough to loan me money for a business and for making me believe it was alright to be who I am. I kissed her. Bet she didn't see that coming. When we broke I grinned. If I did like girls like you, you'd be my choice. I saw a guy watching us like a hawk, a hungry look in his eyes, painfully shy. He worked up enough nerve to come over and ask if he could have a dance with Amy. I told him to ask the lady and she surprised him by agreeing. We watched them on the floor. That's Robbie. He's still finding his way, trying to come to grips with being attracted to girls like us. He's got a major crush on Amy but is scared to death to do anything about it. Looks like he finally found some backbone. They danced two more dances and I saw them get their phones out. 
The night ended with a buzz. Many would remember this as the best night of their lives. Robbie came over and stumbled through an invitation to an after party. The whole crowd was going but I bowed out. I'm leaving pretty early tomorrow. I wouldn't mind Amy going if she had someone to look over her. Could you do that for her, Robbie? Understand that if she gets hurt you'll be the one I come looking for. He stuttered through his assurances as I looked at Amy. You sure? Remember, we came as friends. You go have fun. I expect to hear good things about the rest of the night. She jumped into my arms for a bone-crushing hug before locking down on Robbie's hand. Celeste surprised me by asking if I'd drop her off. Her date had found another after-party and an escort to go with. We got into the limo. If the driver noticed I left with someone different than who I came with he didn't express it. Where are you staying? With you. I didn't make any reservations. I was going to stay with Desiree and her husband. Guess you're stuck with me. I can think of worse fates. She responded by sliding under my arm. I gave her a kiss on the cheek and she sighed. Update 4. We were in bed in minutes. It was one of the best nights of my life. I woke up to find her sitting on the sofa of the suite, drinking room service coffee. All she had on was one of my dress shirts. She looked uncertain but I gave her a pretty good kiss and she relaxed. There better be some coffee for me. She smiled and poured me a cup from the carafe I hadn't noticed before. We sat in easy silence until our cups were empty. Then the question started. What happened last night? She grinned. Destiny, you can go ahead. What are your feelings? When she got done laughing, she told me I'd spent too much time with the tea girls. My feeling, honey, is that we're good together. I have no reservations telling you I've wanted you for years. I've also seen the way you look at me when you think I'm not paying attention. Admit it. There's good chemistry between us. I don't want to screw up our friendship. Duck a bunch of friendship. I'm looking for something deeper, and we both know it. I ain't getting any younger here, and my window is closing. I want two children, three if the first two are the same sex. Then I'm done. You need to think about this. I don't need an answer right now. We need to get used to each other. Last night was a pretty good start and I expect at least one encore before I have to catch my plane. Now kiss me. That sounded better than conversation, so I did. After we got done panting, she smirked. Glad the suite is in your name and not mine. Now let's go shower together. We broke a shower rod. You would have thought a rock band had spent the night when I got the bill. I just grinned and paid it. The courtship lasted four months. I wasn't doing much of anything at the time but watching the money roll in. She was still filming her shows and doing a tour to support her book. I tagged along a few times until I found out when Celeste worked. She worked. She'd spend five hours signing books and posing for pictures refusing to leave until the last book was closed and everyone was satisfied. She introduced me a couple of times as her partner. I knew she meant business partner, at least I think she did, but everyone just assumed we were life partners. The little PDAS may have altered their perceptions a bit. We had sex. A lot. We did everything we could think of and by we, I mean her. Most of it was pretty enjoyable. Some I wouldn't even try. We had a lot of talks about our pasts. Hers was much more colorful than mine. We spent about an hour talking about her swinging days. I'm sure you know that it was 90% Jack, but he's a persuasive bast and after a while I started to enjoy it. Deep down, though, I knew the moment I let another man touch me that the clock was ticking. We would never last. 90% of swingers divorce fairly early and I believe in my heart it was because we gave up the intimacy, the ownership for lack of a better word, of a committed couple. It ended up being just physical functions. Sometimes they were enjoyable physical functions, but when we were done, we were done. Rarely did anyone want to snuggle when it was over, not even the spouses. Jack was usually so drained he was asleep in minutes afterwards. It sounds like fun and games but it can be a pretty lonely life. She took another deep breath. All that being said, the past is the past. The relationships post-Jack were always monogamous. If a partner even hinted about swinging, and a few did because I told them up front about my past, we were through. Pretty much right then. And a couple of relationships were with women. It was one of the few pleasant things to come out of the period. Then she snuggled to me. I won't promise you this, I will guarantee it. If we end up together permanently, it will be just that, together permanently. No others, till death do us part, and I mean it. I was still on the fence. I was pretty sure I'd always been a bit in love with Celeste. Her past intimidated me a little, and I wondered when we were together sometimes if she was thinking of past lovers. I never had that issue. If I was with a woman I was totally into the now of the act. I didn't think of anyone in the past. I did my absolute best to give my partner everything she desired. Admittedly, at odd times I would think of what we did and think about when I did the same thing with someone else and how it was always better with her. My hesitation was starting to put a strain on our relationship. 
She'd thrown a lot of hints the last time we'd been together and I hadn't responded as well as I could have. She left suddenly and I didn't see her for two weeks. Then one night I saw headlights coming up my drive. Final update. I'd bought a few acres at the lake I liked so much. I couldn't get lakefront, but I did get lake access. I had a power boat I rarely used, preferring to go out in the still of the early morning in my kayak. I'd get a good paddle in and be off the lake before the big boats made it too choppy. My house was a four-bedroom cedar ranch-style house with a lot of amenities that included a pool, hot tub, really nice patio with a gas grill, a charcoal grill, a fire pit, and a clay oven. It was off the beaten path but I'd made one of the bedrooms an office and with the internet. Most of my business could be done at home. I was about to get into the hot tub so I put a robe on and went round to see who it was. My heart jumped a little when I saw it was Celeste, then I realized she had someone with her. It was Anne. She'd used her a couple of times on book tours because she had acquired a stalker. They bonded and became friends. I woke with Celeste's head on my chest, her body pressed against mine. Anne was standing at the foot of the bed, showered and dressed. Thanks Roy. I always wondered what you and Celeste would be like in the sack and now I know. She smiled wistfully. This was her last hurrah, Roy. If you can't commit or if you don't love her, turn her loose. As hot and loving as she is she'll find someone pretty quick. Celeste, honey, wake up and tell Anne bye. She grumbled as she popped an eye open. I hope the ring looked huge that close to her face. I've reached a decision. Honey, if you'll have me, I'd like. She was on me so fast we hit the floor in a tangle of covers while Anne took pictures with her phone. She posted the decent ones immediately and in 30 minutes the phones were lighting up. I was going through the wedding cards and found one with no name on it. I always knew you and Celeste would end up together. It is my hope she makes you happy. Best wishes, Jimmy. Jimmy had disappeared for a while after she left the agency. One day she was back with a new man. They were swingers and it lasted about six months. She disappeared again and when she came back, she started her own agency. Her old bosses would farm out small jobs to her and she brought them in to help on projects that took more resources than she could muster. She married a guy she met while working on his campaign and after they dated a year they married. I gave them a wedding present, 1% ownership in the donut franchise. It doesn't sound like much, but it was a nice bit of extra change every year. She found it. It was my hottest moneymaker and I felt a little guilty for taking it from her. They have a little girl now. Jack just disappeared after being served for alienation of affection and even Anne doesn't know where he is. She could find out if she wanted to. She just never had a reason to want that. Philip fared the worst. I didn't press charges because I would have had to charge Jimmy, too. She was never the mastermind, just a gullible and insecure woman. They only managed to get about 20 grand, and I got all of it back. I did send his bosses a detailed account of how he'd used company computers and resources for an illegal activity, and they canned him instantly and let the reason for his termination become common knowledge. No reputable firm would touch him. He went dark web for a while seizing unprotected computers and ransoming them back until he messed up and hacked a major writer. His publishing house put every resource they had towards finding him, and when they did, they turned him over to the feds. He got seven years and was a month from parole when he got into an altercation with another inmate. He ended up having to do his whole sentence, plus 18 months. I wondered every once in a while how he was faring in prison with his slight form and pretty face. I bet he immersed himself in whatever role he was asked to play. Celeste saw me with the card and asked who it was from. I tossed it into the trash. An old business associate. You're grinning that I know something you don't grin. What's up? I'm 10 days late. I'll be getting one of those home kits tomorrow. Well then, good for us. The end. Thanks for reading. Remember, revolving time exists because of your support, and I want it to be a place where we can all come together, learn, and have a great time. Your feedback is vital, and I appreciate every single suggestion and comment you provide. Take care yourself and see you soon.